Welcome to Acts chapter 26 and 27. Uh, I'm going to get through both of these, probably get through them pretty quick. And then uh, next week we'll have one chapter left. And uh, I don't know if I'm going to do anything else or not. I'm, thinking, I'm still thinking about it. But we'll, and we'll be finishing up. Uh, Lord willing, nothing happens. We'll be finishing up next week. And within a couple of weeks, we'll get started on Revelation. And uh, these went pretty quick at church last night. These are... You know, I mean, it's the uh, chapter 27 is just sailing from place to place, and not really a whole lot there to make notes on and uh, to uh, expound on. But uh, nevertheless, you know, it's still the Book of Acts, still part of the Bible. So, if it's in the Word of God, it's important, and it's connected to everything else. So, here we go, Acts chapter 26, verse one. Then Agrippa, now remember, <clears throat> we left off with the. Uh, the big ceremonial pomp, and, you know, King Agrippa and his wife Bernice had come down to uh, Caesarea to uh, welcome the new governor Festus, and you know Festus had been there for you know quite a while now. But this Agrippa, they, this official ceremony kind of thing, welcoming the king coming, and you know Festus had already went to Jerusalem and did all of whatever he had to do up there. And now the king's come down, and and uh, you know remember that they're in the same arena, him and his sister wife. Uh, are sitting in the same arena where his father and he and her father had declared himself God and God got ate up by worms and died right there on the spot so this is a big ceremonial thing lots of people I mean it's a it's not a trial like I said Paul's already he he's he's he's, he's set his fate for his own self he appealed to Caesar so he's going to Rome so this is not a, this is not a trial this is entertainment this is a entertainment that Festus can entertain uh, the king with uh, this man named Paul. So jumping right in, actually, that's where we left off last time. And and here uh, Festus has introduced Paul to Agrippa. Everything you know is probably who knows. They probably spent two hours walking in the arena, sitting down, but whatever. And uh, Paul's fixing to start speaking. Verse one. Then Agrippa said to Paul, "Thou art permitted to speak for thyself." Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. Now, you know, if you, if you hadn't picked up anything through this study of Acts, you're bound to pick up that Paul was a long-winded little guy. He liked to talk. He liked to preach long times, and he, and he liked to talk. And no doubt Paul, if we could meet Paul, no doubt Paul, nobody ever walked by Paul that he didn't try to talk to. I mean, he just strikes me as that kind of man. So he's happy now that he's getting, because, you know, this is like, this is several times now that he's presented this, that he's been, had, had to tell his story. And every time so far, he's got, he hadn't really had a chance to, to tell all of it. That's why he says, I'm touching all these things. He's kind of happy that he gets a chance to uninterruptedly tell his whole story, his whole entire story. Verse three, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. In other words, I got a lot to say. Be patient and let me have my say. Now he knows he's saying that to Herod because Herod was a Jew. Uh, so um, he he knew Paul knew that he was he was acquainted with with Jewry and and the traditions and the things of Judaism, whereof whereas these other people weren't, and he would understand the points that Paul was trying to make. My manner of life, verse four. My manner of life for my youth, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify, or if they would tell the truth, they knew from the beginning that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. That's what he's saying. He says, I was a Pharisee, and they all know it. The Pharisees know that I was a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, which was what? A, res a Messiah, a resurrected Messiah that was coming, that had been raised from the dead. That, that was the promise that they believed in. They believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not. Verse 7, unto which promise the resurrection, the hope of the resurrection, the afterlife, unto which promise our twelve tribes instantly or earnestly and intently serving God day and night hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. And what Paul's saying is, kind of in a way, one way to look at it is, um, here I am, Paul, I'm a Jew, I'm a Pharisee, and the, and, and the Jews are all accusing me of being a good Jew. 
And that's why I should be put to death, because I'm a good Jew. That's basically what Paul's saying. Verse 8, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? All these Jews know, this is, this is my little notes down here, all these Jews know that I'm a Pharisee. And Herod knows the belief of the Pharisees that it's in a resurrection. Paul is asking, in view of all these things, why is it such a strange idea that God raises the dead? That's what he's asking, Agrippa. Why is that such a strange thing? See, we're all Pharisees. You know the Pharisees. You know what we believe in. So why is it all of a sudden everybody's so upset at the very idea that God would raise somebody from the dead? Well, they believed in it from the beginning. Verse 9, I verily thought myself, or I was convinced, that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Now, the, uh, that, that word voice, it's kind of interesting to hear that word voice is actually, the, the, the word is translated from is, is actually Cephas which means a stone, pebble, rock. It's the same thing, it's the same thing Jesus renamed, remember Jesus renamed Peter Cephas, the rock, Peter the rock. That's what the voice, that word voice is translated from that word that means a stone, pebble. And what that means is that's, that's, that, that, that's a throwback to him being part of the Sanhedrin because that's how they would vote. White stone, black stone. It's just the same way, you know, fraternal organizations and all kind of, all kind of things use it nowadays. Why it's okay, black's not. That's where we get the term blackballed. You've been blackballed. That's where that comes from. And that word voice means stone. That's, that's, that's what that means. Verse 11. And I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled or forced them to blaspheme, which means what he's saying is I forced them to deny that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Notice that word cities is plural. We never heard of him going into other cities. He got, he, he was, he, he, got uh, he, he got saved on the road to Damascus. We knew that's what he was doing on the road to Damascus. But apparently, because he used the term cities, plural, and yes, it's important. That's why it's important. That's why the King James is important. He used the word cities. Then apparently that wasn't his first trip out of town. He had, he had made other trips out of town and hauled other people into Jerusalem and had them killed or watched them die or had them locked up in prison. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission <clears throat> from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. Now this is the third time Paul's told the story. He's told the story of his, of his conversion in the book of Acts. This will be the third time that he's told it, or it's been, that it's been recorded. Luke recorded it. I'm sure it's not just the third time he's told it, but this is the third time in the book of Acts that Luke has recorded it. Verse 14, And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying, In the Hebrew tongue, underline that in your Bible, in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. This is the only time of those three, the only time that he, that he sticks that little tidbit in there in the Hebrew tongue. Now, as I've said before many, many times, if I say something that's strictly my opinion that I can't prove one way or the other, I'll let you know that that's my opinion. So what I'm fixing to throw out here is strictly my opinion. This verse right here is why I personally believe when we all get to heaven, everybody is going to speak Hebrew. It's not going to be that big a deal. It's just going to be something that just happens. We show up, we start speaking, everybody's going to speak Hebrew because that language is sacred to God. That language lived. That, 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 that was a dead language. There's no other dead language on earth that ever died and came back. And it, that, is, that, that language is sacred. It's special, just, just like the Jewish nation. The nation of Israel is special and sacred to God. That apparently, the Hebrew language is too. And I personally believe that we're all going to speak Hebrew in heaven. If we're wrong, I will personally find all of you and apologize to you for being wrong. But that's just, that's just my opinion. Verse 15. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things which I will appear unto thee. Of those things into which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. Verse 18, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, 
from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now all through the scriptures, Paul, at some point in time, it has been commanded, Paul has done, he, he, he's done all these things. This, this is the gospel. This is the gospel in another time that the whole gospel is contained in one little, in one little verse. To open their eyes, Matthew 13, 15, and 16. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. That's one of the things that Paul preached. That's one of the things the gospel does for us. If you don't do anything in prayer every day, you should thank God for ears and eyes. As we move into the book of Revelation, we're going to see that that is very, that, 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 that is very, very extremely important. It comes up time and time again. He that hath an ear. Everybody's got ears. I've got ears. That don't mean I hear. That don't mean I understand. That don't mean I, that, that we all pay attention. Thank God every day that you've got eyes and you've got ears to see and to hear the truth. Number two, to turn them from darkness into light. Luke 1, 79 says, to give, them, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. He lights our way. Light. Another thing. And it's all, it runs all through the Bible. It runs the, the light. He's the light that lighted the whole world. He was the light that was sent into the world to light every man that cometh into the world. He is light. He, he, is, the, he is light. John 1, 9 and 10 says, This was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He was rejected. He was turned down. He was sent away. He lit them all up. He razzle-dazzled them. He was healing. He was doing miracles and signs and wonders everywhere he went. And they doggedly, determinedly rejected and hated him and killed him. To turn and from to turn from the power of Satan under the power of God. Colossians 1, 12 and 13 says, Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet or sufficient or able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. He has lit us once we came into his understanding. He lit us from the inside and we shine to the outside. We are that candle that is lit and set upon a hill. That's you. You can light a candle and put it on, but you, but you don't cover it up. That's you. That candle, that candle is supposed to burn and shine. That candle is supposed to spread forth light. What does light do in the nighttime? It draws. It draws bugs. All the bugs will go to it and fly around. It's a, we're supposed to be drawing people. We're supposed to be drawing the bugs to us. Catching them, bringing them in, and offering them that salvation, offering them that light, offering them that chance to come in out of the darkness and let them be a light to shine and go off and shine wherever they go to. Turn them from the power of Satan unto the power of God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 1, 6 through 7, to praise, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Now, if, if you want to feel good, if you want to feel better, if you, if, you want, if, if you don't feel okay right now, stop. Turn that off. Pause it. Stand up and read that out loud. That's Ephesians 1 and 6 through 7. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Who is the beloved? He's the beloved. Who made us accepted in the beloved? He did. Who did all this? He did. It's all him. It's all about him. It's all him. It's all for him. It's all by him. It's all to him. It's all about him. It's all about Jesus. In whom we have redemption through his blood. 
He paid for it. He shed for it. He died for it. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. According to the riches of His grace. For what, what do we remember the book of Ezekiel? Why did I, all them things? Why did I do that? To bring glory to my name. To bring glory to His name, not, not us. He saved us for His purpose, for His work, not for us, for Him, for His name's sake. It's all about Him. Always has been, always will be. And inheritance among them which are sanctified. First Peter uh, 1, 3 and 5, 3 through 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of, Christ Jesus, of Jesus Christ from the dead. Again, listen to what that's saying. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy, not, not me, not mine, not, not for me, not, not according to His abundant mercy, hath begotten us, me, again, born again, begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there would be no rebirth in me into a lively hope. I'd still be dead in my sins without hope, without mercy, and without grace in the world. A detestable Gentile. So would all of us. To an inheritance. What is an inheritance? It's something that somebody gives you. They give it to you for the cause, just because. You might be kin to them. He created us. We're his children. That's inherited. He gave it to us. It's not, we didn't work for it. We didn't earn it. It wasn't mine. I didn't have it coming. It's an inheritance. He gave it to me. Inheritance it's incorruptible and undefiled and that fate is not away. It's eternal. Reserved in heaven for you, for me, who are kept, how? Who are kept by the power of God through faith. It's all by faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in this last time. You can't beat that, folks. You can't beat it. It's all about Him. It's all for Him. It's all by Him. I told somebody the other night in the Bible study, I said, you take the Bible. I hear so much nowadays. I hear this so often. You know, the, what did Jesus say? What did Jesus have to say about that? What did you, how, when, where, where did Jesus say anything about this subject? Where did Jesus say anything about that subject? Where did He talk about it? Listen, you got to understand. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Ghost. Three separate beings, all three of them are one. We understand. Jesus was 100% man, but he was 100% God. So, who inspired the writers to write these things? The Holy Ghost did. Who is the Holy Ghost? He's part of the Trinity. He's part of the one. He's part of the one Godhead. So is Jesus. All three of them are just as much, just as fully anointed, just as fully involved, just as fully bought into that singular Godhead. All three of them, are one, one of them is just as important as the other. So if Jesus is God and God, the Father is God and the Holy Ghost is God, then you can't say Jesus just wrote the words in red. Jesus wrote the whole book from Genesis 1-1 all the way through Revelation 22. He wrote the whole entire book. So the book is about him. It was written for his namesake, and it was written by him. So you can't look at something and say, well, it's okay for that person to do that because Jesus didn't talk about that. What am I talking about? Homosexuality. I had somebody the other day tell me that. I know I got a preacher friend of mine. That he says it's okay to marry gay people because Jesus never specifically addressed homosexuality. Well, I'm sorry he did. He did. Jesus reiterated what was stated in the beginning. Do you, have you not heard that in the beginning they were created male and female? And for that cause, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, not cleave to his husband, not cleave to his boyfriend, not cleave to any to cleave to his wife. There's only one way to heaven. There's only one way to a marriage bed. That's a man and a woman. That's it. That's all there is. And you can't say because there ain't nothing in red about homosexuals that Jesus didn't talk about it because he wrote the whole book. He wrote it all. It's all about him, for him, by him, to him. Verse 19, back in Acts chapter 26. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Paul says, I kept, I did all these. I did it all. I mean, he, I, he did everything he was called to do. Verse 20, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent 
and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. See, it's verses like this in the Bible that make me wonder how these people can use Paul's teachings to say that we don't have to repent anymore. That Paul taught us that we're, we're saved by faith through grace and that's all we have to, we, we don't even have to repent. I mean, I hear people more and more and more talking about that. I see it on Facebook. I hear people out in the world talking about it. We don't have to repent. I mean, we, we, we repented. That's it. We, we, we know that. We're, we're there. You don't have to. You're, we're under grace. It's grace, 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 grace. It's all about grace. And because I, don't, I, because I tell people they've got to repent every day, because that's what the Bible says. You've got to repent every single day. That's what Jesus said. Every single day we've got to repent. The Bible says that. But yet, I get told I'm ashamed of the gospel. I'm ashamed to tell people that, that you know, that, that it's works. I'm turning that into works. They said, it's Jesus. They said, how are we supposed to pray? And he said, let's pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You recognize who he is? You recognize the Father? Hallowed be his name. Thy kingdom come. We pray for his kingdom to come every day. The millennium is coming. It's coming fast. He's coming back. That's what he's talking about. Thy kingdom come. We'll get to that point in Revelation where the angel flies around. And he says, the kingdoms of the earth have become the kingdoms of our Christ. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. Everything on earth, you're praying that his will be done. His will has to increase. My will has to decrease. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. That's how you know you got to pray every day because he told you when, he, when they said, how are we supposed to pray? He tells them, he says, you pray, give us this day our daily bread. So it's not a prayer of repetition. He's saying you got to pray every day. And then he says, forgive me of my sins as I forgive those who trespass against me. What do you think that means? He tells you to pray for bread every day. He also tells you to repent of your sins every day. There ain't no such thing as repenting of your sins and crawling under the grace blanket and staying there forever without doing anything else. That's lazy salvation. That is lazy salvation. Because that way, what, what happens then? See, I'm not saying it won't work. I'm not saying it won't work. I'm not saying you can't say a sinner's prayer one time and go to heaven without ever saying a sinner's prayer again. I'm not saying it won't work because the, the fact of simple salvation is a fact. It's a biblical fact. There is a thing as simple salvation. A man, a, a drunkard, a whoremonger, a whore can lay on a deathbed and pray a prayer of salvation and wake up in heaven. But what happens then? They got no works, none whatsoever. They got no works, none. And let me tell you something else. If you, if you believe that you can get under the grace blanket and stay there forever, and if you remain that way for 20 years, after you've been saved for 20 years and live through this miserable hell of life on earth and you get to heaven, guess what you get there with? No works. No works. Well, why is that important? I got to heaven, isn't that the whole point? No, that's not the whole point. That's not the whole point at all. Because if you get there with no works, then everything, there's no, there's, if you got no works, there's nothing to burn up. If all your works are wasted time, then they're all going to burn up. And then, and then you get no crowns. Well, I don't need crowns. I just want to see Jesus, brother. I, just wanna, I don't need a mansion. I just want to kill a little old cabin in the corner. I hate that song. I always hated that song. We don't serve a God that's going to give you a little old cabin in the corner. You ain't going to heaven with that poor mouth attitude that you had all your life down here on earth. I was talking to somebody the other day, a man I used to know, and, and he owned businesses, he had people working for him, he had, he had money, he, he, you know, as far as I know, he's still going. But I, I, I promise you, if you had never met the man, you could talk to him for less than 10 minutes and you'd be pulling money out of your pocket because you would, you would literally believe that he couldn't afford to fight buy groceries for his family. I mean, that was the poor mouthless man I ever met in my life, and you're not going to do that in heaven. You're not going to stand before a God that created everything out of nothing and poor mouth and say, oh, I just need a little old cabin over in the corner. I don't need no mansion. Bless God. I blah, blah, blah. I just to get over it, okay? If you go to heaven with no works, then you get no rewards. You get no rewards and you got no crowns. You got no crowns and on the day that Jesus is given the kingdom, the day that Jesus is his coronation, the day that he is crowned the king of glory in heaven, and everybody's standing around with their crowns, throwing them at his feet, you're going to stand there empty-handed. And see, it might not be important to you now. You can pull them out now and say, I just, I don't need that. I don't, I don't want to. I, I, but, but I promise you, I promise you that day, 
that day, if you end up standing there that day, empty handed, it's going to be, it's going to matter then. It's going to matter then, that day. Maybe not now, but that day it will. So it ain't, it ain't, it ain't. <clears throat> repent. Repent. That's, a, you know, that's the first thing Jesus said when he came up out of the water. Repent. 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 For the kingdom is at hand. Verse 21. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, or I stood my ground, or I'm still standing my ground here, defending myself, witnessing both too small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and the Moses did say should come. And I mean, he's, he's, he's declaring again that he ain't preaching no new God. He ain't bringing no fresh new version. He ain't got no new revelation. He ain't got no hot news flash right off the throne. To, uh, nothing. No, nothing. He's saying, I'm preaching the same thing I've always preached. And I ain't preaching nothing that Moses and the prophets didn't say was going to happen. Verse 23. That Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Luke 24 and 44 says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I speak unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. What's Paul saying? I mean, what am I saying? That's exactly what Paul was saying. That's the only thing I've been preaching. Verse 24, And as he thus spoke for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning hath made thee mad. Now, obviously, Paul was getting excited. And, and like I said last night at church, if we, if we start sharing the gospel with somebody, if, we start, you know, if, they, if we're standing there and, and we're witnessing to somebody or we're in church praising and we're, or we're at home by ourselves praising and worshiping, and we start talking about the goodness of God and the sweet taste of God and, and, and the, the, the things of God, we should be getting excited too. We should get excited. We should. People should look, walk by and see us doing whatever and think we look funny. We should be getting excited because we're on our way to glory land. We're on our way to Beulah land. We're on our way to a home, a city that's not built without, with hands. We're on our way to eternal rest, eternal life with him in glory. We should be getting excited. We should, we should be. People should look at us and say, you know, <laughs> you're crazy. We should be. Verse 25, but he said, I am not mad. Most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. Paul saying, "Ain't nothing wrong with me. I'm just talking about Jesus, and that's what happens, and that that should be what happens. For the King knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from Him. For this thing was not done in the corner. In other words, he, King Agrippa knows exactly what I'm talking about, Festus. And he's not, you know, he's not dogging Festus. He's not downplaying him. You know, you just sit down and shut up because you don't know what you're talking about. Agrippa knows what's going on. He knows what time it is. That ain't what Paul was saying. He's just saying that I'm not mad. I'm not crazy. And he knows. He knows what I'm talking about. He knows why I'm excited. He knows why we, we should get excited. Verse 27, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost. You almost sold me, Paul. You almost won me over. You almost did that. How many people we have witnessed to that, just, that did that? I don't know how many people I've witnessed to down through the years. And no, saw the look in their face. Saw the you know saw 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 it working on them. When you start talking when you when you start talking about Jesus and witnessing to people that are sinners and they're hearing it. I mean, you can tell when people are just you know, man, I wish you'd shut up and let me go. When there's like that, or when the Holy Ghost is working on them, when that ground's already been plowed and that tree's already been dug and digged around and them seeds has already been watered and they're trying to sprout, they're trying to grow. You can tell. You can you can see what it is. You can tell. And see, that might have been another thing, too. That might have been what Festus, you know, Festus misunderstood and thought Paul was crazy. But at the same time, it's very possible that Festus saw what effect. Because, I mean, Grip is saying, you almost convinced me, Paul. I almost bought it. You almost got me there. And see that Festus could have seen that. He could have seen whatever Paul was. He could have said whatever. I mean, he could be sitting there thinking in his mind, whatever. I know what he, I can hear what he's saying. And somehow or another, it's having an effect on the king that I don't understand, and I need to stop this. That might be another reason Festus stood up and told him that he was acting crazy. 
I mean, Paul might have been jumping up and down. Who knows? He might have been dancing by this time. I'm sure he had, I mean, I'm sure, absolutely sure he had his hands up in the air, probably waving at the sky and talking 90 miles a minute. I'm sure, I'm probably, I'm pretty sure of that. And, and, and maybe Festus saw that what was going on, but it, he saw what effect it was having on the grip, and he said, well, I need to stop this, I mean, because he, he's getting on the king's nerves or whatever, because he, he didn't know what was going on. When the group said, almost, thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, <coughs> except these bonds. Paul spoke those words out loud right there in his defense. And he probably knew that somehow or another Luke was writing him down, writing this down, because, I mean, Luke had been the record keeper all this time. So he knew that was going to get written down. But I, I, I can't help but wonder if Paul had any idea how many millions and millions and millions and millions of people down through the ages was going to hear those words that he spoke right then. I would to God that everybody that can hear my words would be such as I am, except for these bonds. And how often has that worked? He might have almost persuaded Agrippa. Agrippa might have got up and walked away from it. But I guarantee you there is multiple thousands of them that didn't, that heard what Paul said. And the Holy Ghost has rung true in their hearts, and they've accepted Jesus into their life. And they didn't. They're like Agrippa and get up and walk away at the same exact words that he did. Verse 30, And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor and Bernice, and they sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or bonds. This is the fifth time, five times, since this all started, a little over two years ago by this time, two and a half, maybe close to three years by now. Five times by five separate people, Paul's been declared, publicly declared, free and, and not guilty of any charges. But he remained. He stayed. God used him all through it. We're going we, we're gonna to read through chapter 27. I don't even have notes on chapter 27. It's just basically reading it out loud and i got a couple of comments on here. Because like I said, it's just sailing. It's, just the, it's the ship sailing. It's, it's the, the ship ride to Rome. Getting to Rome. And uh, he works, Paul works, he's witnessing, of course, everywhere he goes. They stop several times, he meets with the brethren, he meets with fellow people, he heals, you know, they stop one time and he heals people that are dying, and the whole, you know, we, we, we're going to get into all that, but he, he, he's working as he goes, he's making an impact as he goes, but again, don't forget, don't let it slip your mind now, especially now after we went through this whole book and studied this, that he didn't have to do this. They, they tried. The, 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 the God tried to stop the man from going to Jerusalem. He tried to. I don't know when Paul should have walked into Rome, but I guarantee you it wouldn't have been this late a date. I guarantee you if Paul had done what, he, what the Holy Ghost was trying to get him to do, way back yonder, then he would have long ago done been in Rome instead of sitting in this jail cell in Caesarea, Jerusalem and Caesarea all this time. Moving right along, Acts chapter 27, verse 1. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners under one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustus band. Now, this, this centurion of the Augustus band is uh, not just an ordinary Roman soldier. This was apparently, this guy Julius was sent from Rome <clears throat> to get Paul. The Bible don't say that, but what that means, that referred to that Augustus man, what that refers to is he was he was part of the, the palace. He was part of the palace guard. That Augustus is referring to Caesar. He was part of Caesar's, of Caesar's guards, the ones that guarded the emperor. The Augustus man, that's, that's, what that, that's what that's alluding to. That's what that's referring to, the Augustus man. This wasn't just some simple soldier, and he wasn't some simple centurion. He was, he was apparently, he was sent there to get Paul to bring him to Rome on a special assignment. Verse 2, And entering into the ship of Adramidium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a, Mas a, Mas a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And this Aristarchus, he's, um, he's with Luke and Paul. Paul's uh, Luke traveling too, but Aristarchus is mentioned in, uh, in Acts chapter 19. He's mentioned in Acts chapter 20. He's mentioned here in Acts chapter 27. And he's mentioned in Colossians chapter 4 and Philemon, in the book of Philemon, which is only one chapter. He was a long-term, a long-time uh, 
companion uh, Paul. I'm sure that Luke and and and, uh, and Aristarchus were not traveling as prisoners. They were traveling as guests. They might have even when they when they took ship and sailed, they might have even had to buy passage. They might have had to pay for their passage. I don't, I don't know. But 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 anyway, they they were traveling with him. They were going with him. Verse three. And the next day, we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul, and gave him liberty to go on to his friends and to and to refresh himself. And they're still pretty much up and down the coast of Judea on the, on the Mediterranean. And so Paul would have had, I mean, this is where he spent the last 20 years of his life, traipsing up and down this coastline through these cities. He would have known people everywhere around here for the time being. Verse 4, And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. In other words, they had to go a way that they didn't normally go. And when we had sailed over the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. Now this was, a the little research told me this was probably a, a boatload of grain. It was, it was an Egyptian boat, more than likely. Well, it was from Alexandria, <clears throat> but it was full of Egyptian uh, wheat or, or barley or some kind of grain, go, you know, going to Italy get to be sailed and brought into Rome. Because Rome had to import everything that, you know, pretty much in, everything that came to Rome had to be imported from somewhere else. Verse 7, when we had sailed slowly many days and scarce were come over against Sinaitis, I don't know how to pronounce that, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmone. And hardly passing it, came into a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. And when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast, and that, the fast was referring to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which means that it's now September, late September, early October. <clears throat> so it's getting on to winter time. Was now, and the fast was now already passed. Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading or the stuff that's in the boat and the ship, but also of our lives. Um, this was storm season. It, it was, you know, they, they were in the middle. It was, it was just cranking up. It was just getting ready to go. Nevertheless, the centurion Julius believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken of by Paul. He will live to regret this. He will live through this, but he will live to regret this decision by Paul. I mean, by, by you know, by making this decision uh, based on what the man on the boat said. And because, verse 12, because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart, to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phenice and there to winter, which is in the haven of Crete, and lie toward the southwest and northwest. Now, if the truth be known, what this really means, if you go and look at these towns, these cities, these little islands where all these little cities are, you'll see that you'll see that this little place where they, where they were at, and Paul said we shouldn't go any further, it was just a little rinky-dink place. But they knew they were going to have to spend the winter there. They knew they were going to spend, you know, five, six months there, or at least four or five months. So the, the whole point was to get on somewhere with a little bigger city with a little better nightlife. We get on down to Crete, you know, Phenice and Crete, those are a little bit bigger cities. There's, you know, there's, there's gambling, there's drinking, there's brothels, there's all those kind of things what, that were important to the Roman soldiers. So I'm just, this is, that's the WKW version of what I see happening here in verse 12. Again, my opinion. Verse 13, and when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their purpose, loosened thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. Now, I stumbled upon this information. Uh, they, they named these winds. I just thought it was kind of interesting that they, these, these winds, these wind patterns is, is what it is. It's, there's these, these wind things in Hawaii. I've heard people, I've never been to Hawaii, but I've heard them talk about the trade winds that, you know, you can count on them. They're, they're, they're always there or they come and go or whatever. But this wind, this particular one, this Eurocladon, Ur is the same. If you've ever read the, the novel Moby Dick, you know it starts out in a little bar where you know the the Muslim guy meets the Captain Ahab and all that, but but they're they're in the middle of a bad storm uh, at the beginning of that book before they take, and that's that that's the name of the storm in Moby Dick is the same name as this right here. That's that's just free. You can do with that whatever you want with that information. Verse 15. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive, or it was drifting. We just let it go and let it drift. And running under a certain island which is called Clauda. We had much work to come by the boat. 
Now what this means, it took me a while to figure this out, find this out. What this means is that uh, back in the day, these the big ship, the, these ships weren't big. You know, we, well, at least I do. I, when I when I see hear the word ship, sailing ship, I you know we live in a day with these gigantic you know cruise ships and stuff. So I see big giant ships in my head when I see the word ship. But these were ships, you know, big for their day, but they weren't all that big. But anyway, they towed the lifeboat behind them instead of taking up the space and had it on board, they would tow it behind them. But in storms like this, in bad storms, they would bring it in or they would come by the boat. And that's what that means is they had a lot of trouble because of the storm, they were trying to get the lifeboat into the ship and they had a lot of trouble coming by the boat. That's what that refers to. Verse 17, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strike sail, and so were driven. Now, undergirding the ships, another thing, I learned more about sailing ships in the first century in the Mediterranean Sea than I ever wanted to know. But what that means is they would, in these storms, these, these boats would rack. The storms, the waves, and the, and the wind, and all these, these, these boats would rack back and forth like this. It would twist, in other words, in the water. And they would, this undergirding the ship, they would take big ropes or cables, sometimes cables, and they would, they would wrap them. They would wrap them from the deck all the way down underneath the boat. And then above, the de above on the deck, they would, where they came together, they would use this tourniquet-like thing where they'd put a, a staff in there, a pole, and they would use that to tighten, to loosen and tighten these ropes that were wrapped around the belly of the boat. And they would tighten those things up, and what it would do, it would keep the ship from racking and twisting in the water, and it would keep it from busting up. So that's what that's talking about, the undergirding the ship. Verse 18, and we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lighted the ship and they started throwing stuff overboard. People was throwing their belongings out. They would start with useless stuff that nobody needed and, you know, as the storm went on, or, and, and the, what they would do was they would, more and more stuff would go. Uh, and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. Uh, and, and Paul and all of them, you know, they were, they were all, they were, they were all throwing it out. They were having to get into the tackling, the, you know, the stuff that made the ship go. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. Here again, you know, they didn't have cell phones. They couldn't whip out their cell phone and you put their GPS tracker on finding out where they was at. They hadn't seen the sun or the stars in many days. That's what they used to navigate. So not only had they been in a storm for all these days, they had no idea whatsoever where they were. They'd been drifting. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't do anything about it. They'd just been sitting dead in the water, being tossed about with the storm, and had literally no idea where they even were because that's how they would navigate. Verse 21, but after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. In other words, Paul stood up and said, I told you so. Verse 22, And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. Now I'm sure at that point in time, if any of them had any faith whatsoever in what Paul was saying, they would have all been happy except the guy that owned the ship. He would be the only one sitting there going, wait a minute, now hold on a minute. You know, he would have been the one upset. Verse 23, for there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. Once again, God gets a personal visit, not from Jesus this time, but still he gets a personal visit. Again, time and again. That just don't happen. Daniel's the only other person in the Bible that's that way. I mean, he gets, he gets visited over and over again. And gets a personal visit. Verse 24 saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. Again, he's letting him know you're going to make it to Rome. You've got to get to Rome. Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given them all, uh, given all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. Now in, in the next chapter, in chapter 28, we find out this island is, is what we know today as Malta. That's the island, the island where they end up landing on. But when the 14th night was come, and we were driven up and down in Adria, or the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. They could tell. I mean, they were sailors. They could tell. They, 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 could, they could hear breakers in the you know, distance and breakers on the cliffs or whatever. But, I mean, they, they, they were sailors. They would have known they was getting close to some kind of land. They just didn't know where they were. 
and sounded, verse 28, and found it 20 fathoms, or 120 feet to the bottom. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms, which is 90 feet. So they knew they were getting closer. The bottom's getting closer to the boat. Then fearing lest that we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. Another reason why I thought that's how they knew they was getting close, they heard waves breaking on the land, on the, on the, the cliffs and rocks and stuff. So they didn't, want to, they didn't want to get busted up, so they thought, you know, they'll anchor down and, and wish or wait for it to get daylight. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color, as though they would have cast anchors out of the uh, out of the foreship. Now, that under color meant that means at night they, they were they were being sneaky. They were they, they were they, they were. Let me read it again. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat in the sea under color, if you change that under color or in a sneaky way or under cloak of darkness or or you know you know being at the pre at, at, at trying to trying to sneak away. So they let down in the sea under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. In other words, they were saying, we're going to, you know, we're going to do something. But they were letting the live boat down in the water. Um, Paul saw what was going on. Verse 31, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. And this time, Julius paid attention. He, he paid attention to what Paul said. And he, he listened to him. So that then the soldiers, verse 32, <coughs> the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off or let her go. They let the lifeboat go. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that you have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. None of them had ate, ate anything for two weeks, two whole weeks, fighting the storm, working day and night, fighting it. And, and the only thing I can compare this to in my mind, I'm, I'm not a sailor, I've never been out, but I've watched, I remember watching uh, Deadliest Catch, them guys, them crab guys up there, you know, and, and I remember... I've seen several storms, them guys getting into storms and they're out there trying to work and it's staying out in it, you know, fighting and and you know they're doing all that. It's just, that's what this what this is the the scene that keeps playing through my head when I'm trying to imagine the storm and them doing that being out in it. But they've been doing this for fourteen for two weeks with no food. Um, wherefore I pray you take some meat, for this is for your health. Now this that word is health is G forty nine ninety one is soteria S O T E R I A as translated one time as health and forty times as salvation. This is for your health or your salvation. For there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. Verse thirty five. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took meat, and we were all in the ship, two hundred, three score, and sixteen souls. That's two hundred and seventy-six people. Two hundred and seventy-six people. On his way to a Roman prison in a ship in the middle of the sea in a storm that had raged for two weeks, Paul witnessed the power and the salvation of God to 276 more people. Like I said, God used Paul mightily. Even when Paul was in disobedience, he used him mightily. That's not a good, that's not, that's not a, a, an exhortation to say, well, you know, God's going to use me anyway, so I might as well go and do all these stupid things I'm not supposed to do, not in any way, shape, or form. That's not what I'm saying. Paul was in disobedience, and he's ended up in a lot of these places, but still God is using him. He's making use of him, 276 people. And when they had eaten enough, verse 38, they lighted the ship and they cast out the wheat into the sea. So... Uh, the grain and what they were hauling. You know, by this time they figured, you know, <laughs> it, it, it might as well go. Verse 39, And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded if it were possible to thrust into ship. And when they had broken up, when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves under the sea and loosed the rubber bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made towards the shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, or they ran up on a sandbar. And the forepart stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. They got stuck on that sandbar, and the waves just kept beating the back end of the ship. Because Paul told them, you know, nobody's going to die, but the ship's going to be gone. 
and the soldiers council was to kill the prisoners lest any of them should swim out and escape because they were responsible for them you know they would have been if they showed up and said no our prisoners escaped because we had a shipwreck you know it wouldn't matter about the shipwreck they would have had to die they would have had you know they would have been judged for that they would have had to, they, they're responsible for it so so to save their own skins they just killed the prisoners and they said you know we was in a shipwreck and they was going to escape so we had to kill them all then they're not in trouble at all Funny how that works out. 43, but the centurion, Julius, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't a requirement, apparently, in the Roman army to be able to swim. Otherwise, he would have said for all the soldiers to jump in and swim to shore. And the purpose would be so that they could get to shore and get stabilized on their feet, and then they could watch and witness the other ones, the, 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 the prisoners, that could come ashore. It don't say, there's 276 people, this is that, that, I'm, I'm, that includes, you know, the Paul and the prisoners, and the soldiers, and whoever was, however many was on the ship running the ship, so who knows how many, I, it don't say how many prisoners there were, the number of the prisoners. But there, they, you know, they, apparently there was quite a few, there was more than just a couple, anyway. So uh, he told the ones that could swim to go in, so they jumped in and because he wanted to say Paul, he wanted to listen. he's listening to Paul now, he's paying close attention to Paul now. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all, safe to land, just exactly like the angel had told him would do. None of you are gonna lose your life, none of you are gonna lose a hair off your head, but the ship's gonna be gone. And that is the journey. That's chapter 26 and chapter 27. Paul talking to King Agrippa in the book of Acts and his journey to Rome as he gets to Rome. Next up is chapter 28, the last chapter in the book of Acts. It's not finished, by the way. Um, I, I, am with, I am with the school of thought that there was more to come to the book of Acts and for whatever reason it never did get written and Luke closed it up, wrapped it up pretty quick here in the very end. Like I said, you know, from the beginning, I, I think I really, I really believe that the book of Acts was a paper, a legal document written when it was found out that Paul was going to Rome, that the book of Acts was put together at that time to be a legal document to present to Nero with him because you didn't go Again, you wasn't going to Felix's judgment seat here. You could just walk in and, and do this. Or you, you're not hiring a lawyer in Jerusalem that says he knows all about Roman law, Tertullus, and coming down. You're going before Nero. You're going before the Supreme Court. You don't just you don't just knock on the door of you know Ginsburg office and say I got something I want to talk to y'all about and go in and have a chit chat with the Supreme Court. You come prepared. You know, you get you get your ducks in a row, and you cross all your T's, and you dot all your I's, and you know you take all the ain'ts and don't knows and all that stuff out, and you 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 make it. I think that's what Acts is, and that's why it wraps up. Because I'm well, you'll see when we get if you hadn't read ahead, surely you've all read the whole book of Acts at some point in time. So you had to wonder when you got the end of it that. It just seems like it's unfinished, kind of like Jonah. You know, you get to the end of the book of Jonah, and you're like, what? Oh, wait a minute. You know, where, where's the rest? Wait a minute. Where's the rest of this at? And Acts, is kind of, Acts is kind of the same way. So I'm just chattering and rattling on here. Um, next week, chapter 28, and whatever else I decide to tag on to the end of it, I don't know if I will or not. I may just let it stand at that. Um, chapter 28 again, kind of short. Got to go kind of quick, and uh, not much to it. And uh, then we'll get started after a little bit on uh, Revelation. Uh, again, as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for your prayers. I covet your prayers. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, thanks for your comments, especially for your comments. I, I love the comments. Even if you don't do anything but tell me that I'm ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love them because it lets me know what people think. It lets me know how I'm doing. Uh, so until next time, God bless you. And uh, I'll pray for you and you pray for me.